Well, I wonder when it was, like, when was the last time you had a really good lament? Um, I feel like it might be a little bit of a lost art uh, these days. Not too many people default to knowing how to do a good lament. Um, And it's also Mother's Day, and it was kind of a little bit tricky to make a link between lamenting and Mother's Day. I I was trying to work out how to (laughs) kind of angle that. And... I, I, I guess that even though it is tricky to find a link, there's, there's not really a lot of sackcloth and ashes mixed in with the old Mother's Day celebrations, is there? Um, you know, guess what, Mum? I got you a great gift. It's a sack. Yeah. Uh, have a go with this. And or to go along with that, here's some ashes. And you can smear them on your face and rub them through your hair. Um, I guess it would be a memorable Mother's Day uh, if you went down that path. Uh, probably for the wrong reasons, correct. Probably for the wrong reasons. Uh, Mother Day, Mother's Day is a day when we remember our mothers and celebrate and thank God for them, but I also recognise it can also be a tough day for some. Well, this week we look at part two of an eight-part series from the Old Testament book of Joel. Uh, and today we think a little bit about that idea, that concept of a lament. Last week we looked at the first part of chapter one, And we engage with this idea that there was an invasion, an invasion of locusts, which destroyed everything in their path. There was no escape from them. I think today's passage is helpful for us in three ways. Firstly, uh, the reminder that we must turn to God. We must turn to God. Secondly, that the day of judgment is a real day and we'd better be ready. And thirdly, that we can call out to God when there is no hope. So let's have a look at the first part of tonight's reading uh, from Joel chapter 1, verse 13. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Joel the prophet speaks the words of the Lord in verse 13 and he he directs the priests to put on sackcloth and mourn. And again, it's not a common practice for us today, is it, to mourn in that way? Um, It was a humbling experience. It was uh, part of repenting. It was part of uh, turning to God for his mercy and his forgiveness and his salvation. Uh, When it came to sackcloth and ashes, there was no room for arrogance, only coming to God humbly. And notice the words there in the passage, mourning and wailing. Uh, Life and death are at stake. And probably the most common use of mourning and wailing today is in a funeral context, isn't it? When somebody has died, somebody who's cared about, and there's mourning and there's wailing and there's sadness. Uh, It's in a life and death context. It's a very serious situation. The locusts have come, they've stripped the earth, Uh, And now the nation, God's people, don't know what to do. And the ability of the people to bring offerings to God at the temple through the priests has been cut off as well. And you notice that reference there, that the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. So the normal mechanisms that God's people had to engage with God to um, deal with the sins, the wrong things that they they had done were removed. They were taken away uh, because there wasn't enough staff to be able to do that. So it's not just a physical problem, the lack of food and the potential image, uh, damage that will come from that, but there's a spiritual problem as well. They can't get right with God. They can't engage with God in the way that they usually would. And in verse 14, Joel tells them to declare a holy fast. And you notice there in the passage, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders, the leaders, but not just them, Uh, Summon all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. I don't know when you last went through some fasting. Um, Different people do it these days for different reasons. You might have a medical procedure. You've got to fast the night before to get ready for that. Um, Some people have health reasons for fasting. Uh, but last time I was trying to remember when I might have done a fast, and it was probably a 40-hour famine back when I was younger. I don't know if anybody's ever, ever done one of those, World Vision, 40-hour famine. 
and you stock up on water and barley sugars and as you go through about uh, certain you hit the start time in, in your cruise and the first few hours you go yeah this is going to be easy and then you get a little bit further in and you wake up Saturday morning and you go you know what this isn't going to be easy and then there's this sort of delicate balance of how many barley sugars can I eat legitimately before it starts to cross over into I've actually been eating lots of stuff um, you've got to kind of navigate that space uh, but if you've ever experienced that or experienced something like that, you know what it's like to go without, to feel uh, the hunger and, and what that triggers in your thinking. Uh, it, it gets you focused on the fact that you need food and in hopefully in the 40-hour famine context, thoughtful about those who you are seeking to support uh, as you seek to support World Vision. The people here are called to fast and to cry out to God. See, it's only God who can help. It's only God who can save. So the next part of the passage, we see this reference to the day of the Lord, verse 15. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. The day of the Lord is near. That day will be total, like destruction from God. There will be no escaping a bit like the locust plague, which we saw in the first half of the passage where there was no escape for it. They impacted everyone, everyone in, the, in that uh, whole region, that whole society, that whole culture. The locust plague, no escape. And we reflected um, on that again in the first part of the chapter. And we see that there's this, there's this link between the totality of the locusts and this concept of the day of the Lord. The day of judgment, the final day when we come before God. And we see this theme continue throughout Joel, where the, the locusts are used as a metaphor for the day of judgment, something that can't be escaped. And all of the earthly things that you rely on in a difficult crisis will not help you on that day of the Lord. So on the day of the Lord, it won't matter how much money you have in the bank. On the day of the Lord, it won't matter what your real estate portfolio looks like. It won't matter how big your superannuation is. It won't matter what level of education you've achieved. It won't matter how good your family network or your friend's network is. The only thing that will matter on the day of the Lord is where you stand with Jesus. You see, there's a, a, a kind of a temporal application, which is the immediate application of what's happening for God's people. There has been a locust plague. There are um, threats to them physically because they don't have access to grain and a whole range of different things that are happening. And you, you see the, the strength of that language listed there um, as it refers to the, the sad state of affairs. So you've got that in the physical, in the temporal, in the immediate sense. But you've also got this this eschatological sense this one day sense the thing that will happen in the end times the the thing that is linked to the day of the lord when jesus returns now, there's a, a double application and the challenge is how are we ready for that day and the language describing the day is intense isn't it food cut off seeds shriveled storehouses in ruins grain dried up even the cattle moan even the cattle moan. I grew up in Bega, and um, in Bega there's a lot of cows. And I don't know if you've ever heard a distressed cow. Um, it's actually not a very pleasant thing to hear. Like, a distressed cow um, is, is very unsettling. And in fact, um, I'm going to try to do an impression of a distressed cow right now. I tried this in the morning. I've been practicing a little bit. But it goes something like, like this. No! No! Uh, there's, 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 there's great strain, there's great distress. And, and I remember the first time I saw it, I was visiting a friend's farm at Bega, and the situation had occurred that a cow, one of the cows had died. And, and uh, my mate's dad had to go and get the cow removed by tractor so that it was you know, out of the area that it had died. And, and all of the cows around it kind of went a bit crazy. And they were making that noise as, as part of the herd. They were distressed because uh, there was a dead cow that was being moved. They didn't know what was going on. It was unsettling. Uh, in the same way, there was, a, there was a, um, another example when, when we had a, a child, um, a child of a cow, sorry, child of a cow, 
And, and the, the calf, thank you, the calf, the calf was being removed from the mother because there had been issues with the birthing process and they needed to care for the mother. But the mother responded in a similar way. And we see here in this, this passage, uh, the reason for the cow's distress for the cattle to moan is that they have no pasture. Uh, they have nothing to eat. Uh, this is the, the thing, and, and the passage goes on to say even the sheep are suffering. So I don't know if you know anything about sheep versus cattle. Um, again, somewhere like Bega is fairly green. You need longer grass for the cattle to, to graze. When it comes to sheep, you think about areas like Goulburn and Yass, where it's kind of lower levels of ground cover, and sheep can survive and they can forage in that kind of space. Um, so even the sheep, who don't need the long, thick, rich grass, they can forage on soil. So even the sheep are not doing well. Even the sheep are unsettled. Now, this is how dire the situation is. Not just the people, but the animals impacted as well. See, the reason, there, there is reason to lament. The locusts have been devastating. The outlook is really not good. And you must be prepared for the final day of judgment. Let's look on to the final part of the passage, verse 19. To you, Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness, and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. Streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. See, where do you go in an impossible situation? Will you call out to the Lord? Where do you go when there is no hope? Will you call out to the Lord? And, and verse 19 holds the hope, uh, even in the, middle, in the midst of fires and drought, there is, there is hope. It's this glimmer of the hope to come. To you I call, says the prophet Joel. To you I call, Lord, I, to you, Lord, I call. And in life, you'll face situations like this, physically, mentally, spiritually, where it seems that there is no hope. But there is a glimmer of hope in the words, to you, Lord, I call. And in fact, there's more than a glimmer of hope because it's hope in the Lord, isn't it? And whether it's the people of Israel two and a half thousand years ago, whether it's uh, Jesus' disciples at the time of Jesus' death, whether it's you today, there is hope in Jesus. We see a number of examples of lament in the Bible. And I was thinking about this and reflecting on this. And, and one of the best examples, I think, is actually in Jonah. So you're familiar with the story of Jonah. Um, he gets called by God to go and talk to this city, 120,000 people, a city called Nineveh. Uh, Jonah doesn't want to do that. Uh, he jumps on a boat to try to get away. Uh, it gets thrown in the ocean, swallowed by a fish, vomited out by the fish, uh, and then it gets another crack at, at doing the mission God had sent him on. Uh, and that's where we find ourselves in, in chapter 3 of the book of Jonah. And, and listen to some of these words as we reflect on this idea of, of lamenting before God. Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least and listen to this, put on sackcloth. Verse 6, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation that he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger 
so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. It was the right response from the city. The city was saved. And if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have handed your life over to him, then you don't need to be afraid of the day of judgment. Jesus' death on the cross to deal with your sins means that you have been liberated from death by a God who loves you very much. So I wonder, are there important things? Are there things that you need to ask God to forgive you for? Sins that you carry deeply, things that are eating away at you, things you need to repent of. And if God is challenging you about something that you need to bring to him, then you need to act on it. You need to ask his forgiveness. You need to make amends if someone else is involved. You need to call out to God. Are you ready for the day of the Lord? And getting things right with Jesus is the key. So we reflected a little bit on sackcloth and ashes. We've touched on the idea of the day of the Lord being real. Uh, we've talked about calling to God and the hope we find in Jesus. Now, I don't expect that end of the service tonight that there'll be a rush up to Bunnings or tomorrow morning down to Spotlight to try to pick up some Hessian to make some sackcloth to wear around for the next week. Not expecting that, but maybe, maybe there's something else you can do to help you clear your mind and focus on God and come humbly before him. It's kind of like that 40 days we sometimes take leading up to Easter, isn't it? Where we might um, sort of set something aside or do a particular uh, prayer thing or, or something just to help us um, get thinking a little bit about um, what God has done for us celebrating that at Easter. And if you give something up, to remind you to focus on God. It's, it's not about earning God's favour, is it? It's about focusing on God. It's about humbling ourselves before him and honouring him in the way that we live. So let me pray. Lord God, we uh, do need your help. We thank you for this passage. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, even though uh, chapter 1 of, of the book of Joel is, is fairly grim, and seems in some ways fairly overwhelmingly hopeless, we thank you, Lord, that there is actually hope in calling out to you. And I pray for all of us gathered here tonight, Lord, that this week would be a week when we do call out to you, that we take our concerns and worries and anxieties to you in whatever form. And, Lord, we seek your hand upon our lives. Help us to, help us to serve you faithfully. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.